I told this story uh, years ago, but it really fits the sermon today, so I'll tell the story again. When I was in uh, Bible college on the wrestling team, one of the guys that wrestled with me, his name was Lou. Lou's parents were missionaries to Chile, and Lou was never able to be with his family at Thanksgiving or Christmas time, and I felt kind of sorry for Lou, and I asked my parents if I could invite Lou to dinner for Thanksgiving dinner, and they said, sure, bring him in. So we picked him up in the, at the train station in Wilmington, brought him up to our house, and, and dinner was served, and Lou was delighted to be there, and around our table, all the food is on the table, and the, it's passed all the way around the table, and people take whatever they want, and Lou took fairly good helpings of everything that was there, and and as was tradition, we would always start again passing it around, and people would take an extra piece of turkey or maybe an extra spoonful of uh, mashed potatoes. And Lou, he took another big helping of everything that was on the table, loaded up his plate. And so my grandfather said to him, after he finished that second full plate of food, would you, Lou, would you like anything else? And he says, oh, I'd love to have something else. And so we started passing all the food around, and Lou took another huge helping and filled his plate to the rim. And there must have been something on the table that didn't get to him. And he's looking at it, and somebody says, do you want that? And he says, oh, I don't want to look like a pig. <laughs> and my, my brother, who was about eight, said, oh, you passed pig a long time ago. <laughs> to make matters worse, when the dessert was offered, my mother came out and said something like this. We have pumpkin pie, mincemeat pie, cherry pie, and apple pie. What would you like? And he said, I'll take a piece of each. <laughs> Why not? So we got all done, and um, we had to take him back to the train station. He gets to the train station, and he says, oh, you know, I better get a hot dog and a soda to hold me over. He had a 35-minute train ride back to Philadelphia. And, uh, you know, it was really interesting. He was one of these dinner guests that you wish had never come to dinner on Thanksgiving because there were no leftovers. <laughs> there were no leftovers. I love turkey sandwiches, you know, and there was nothing left. Well, I want to tell you what Jesus did at a dinner party that made people wish he had never come to that dinner party. Let me quickly tell you what he did. He... He broke a religious taboo by healing somebody on the Sabbath day. He then insulted the guest. He then insulted the host. And then he told everybody that was at the dinner party that they were going to hell. That's a dinner guest. You really don't want to come to your house. Well, Jesus came. So let's take a look at deeper at this text. We're in Luke chapter 14. We're in verses 1 to 24, beginning with verse 1. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Uh, one text says from dropsy. Jesus asked the Pharisee, the experts of the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. And we're going to stop our reading there. But there's this dinner party at the home of a Pharisee. He is most likely the leading regional leader of that community. He's the top dog, and uh, he has invited a bunch of religious people to his house, and he's invited Jesus. He's also invited another man who has dropsy. Now, the best we know about dropsy then was that it was uh, their arm, the person's arms and legs and stomach were bloated significantly by water retention. They probably had a hard time breathing. It maybe it was affecting their heart. This man would have been very uncomfortable. Back in Jesus' day, they believed that this problem was punishment from God for doing something immoral. So this is not the kind of man 
that a religious leader would have invited to his dinner party. So why was he there? He was a plant. This religious leader wanted to catch Jesus in doing something that wasn't allowed by the law because the religious leaders had made up their minds that Jesus had to be eliminated. Now, Jesus wasn't blind to what was going on. He was fully aware of what they were doing, but he still wants to heal this man. And so he asked the question of the religious leaders, is it against the law to heal on the Sabbath? And he gets no response. Now, why wouldn't they have said yes or no? Well, the answer is this. If they said, yes, it's against the law, then they would be misrepresenting the law of Moses because the law of Moses never forbid healing on the Sabbath. If they said no, then they would be undermining their additions to Moses' law, which said you can't heal on the Sabbath. So they decided to be quiet. So Jesus heals the man and then sends him away. And then Jesus reminds the people at the dinner party, oh, by the way, would you work on the Sabbath day if your son fell in a well or your ox fell in a ditch? Would you help them out? Of course you would. And then that's the end of that little conversation. Now, Jesus really makes a point here. When, a man, when man-made rules get in the way of loving and helping other people, the rules are worthless. Don't forget that. Then he insults the guest. Now, if you're looking for the main principle of this conversation, it's found in verse 11, which says this, For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, you have to understand this, that back in Jesus' day, the table was sort of shaped like a semicircle. And when the host of the dinner party would come and sit down at the table, he would sit at the pinnacle of that circle, just sort of like in the, the bulletin you have the host right at the middle of that table. And then people who of, of greatest importance would sit next to the host or as close as they could get to the host. So during a pre-meal time, maybe people eating hors d'oeuvres and walking around having a, a Pepsi or something, walking around. They would mill around the table and talk to each other, but if this was the head of the table, they wouldn't venture too far away from that head of the table because when the host came and sat down, that was the sign that now you could be seated. So you know how musical chairs work? You play the music and then you pull a chair out and, and one person's left standing. Well, they would have seen the host sit down and they would have scurried to get their seat and the one that sat closest to the host was considered to be the most important in that gathering. Well, Jesus watches the people take their seat. He waits for them to be seated. He may have sat at the very end of the table. And then after they are seated, he tells them a parable. Listen to what he says, verse 8. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host will, who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, basically, what Jesus is saying is this. I was watching you find your seat, and I noticed that some of you thought that you were more important than the other guest. Ouch. They knew what he was saying. It's an irony here, though. They're trying to prove their importance. And they have no idea who is sitting at the dinner table with them. I want you to hear this. 
They were sitting in the presence of God. Can you imagine the conversation? The religious people, oh, I've been serving God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And Jesus goes, yeah, right. <laughs> Rolls his eyes, shakes his head. You have no idea what I know about you guys. So he's insulted the guest. Then he insults the host. Listen to what it says in verse uh, 12. Then Jesus said to the host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, or your sisters, or relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so, will, so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, and the crippled, and the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous." In that day, it was customary, it was actually expected that if you were invited to someone's house for dinner, you were obligated to return the favor at some time and invite them to your house for dinner. It was just expected. Have you ever heard that? Well, I had them over, maybe they'll have me over. We had them out for dinner, maybe they'll have us out for dinner. It's that concept there. But it was, ob it was an obligation in that day. If somebody invited you to dinner, you'd invite them. Now, if you couldn't pay them back, they understood that. And God said, if they can't pay you back, then you're going to get reward at the resurrection of the righteous. Now, what Jesus is trying to say to the host is this. By looking at the people you invited to your house today, you're looking for rewards now. And you're forfeiting rewards in the kingdom. Ouch. What's more important? Rewards now? Pat on the back now? Repayment now? Or standing before God and having God look at you and say, good job. What would you rather hear? That's not rhetorical. Good job. <laughs> then the fourth thing. He tells everybody that they're going to hell. Listen to what it says. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Now let's stop there. In the midst of this very awkward dinner party, you can't tell me this wasn't awkward, okay? He's healed somebody you didn't, and he was the plant, and he got away with it, and now he has insulted the guests, he's insulted the host, and the tension in the room is growing. Someone decides to diffuse the situation by saying to Jesus, yo, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Isn't it going to be great, Jesus, when... All of us are going to be seated at the table in the kingdom and the Messiah is going to be there and we're going to be feasting with him. Isn't it going to be great when we all get to heaven? Now, I want you to remember something. The Jewish people felt that because they were part of the physical descendants of Abraham, that they were right with God and they would enter into heaven. God had made a covenant, had made a contract with Abraham, and they thought that anyone physically related to Abraham was an invited guest to the eternal kingdom banquet. So this guy tries to change the subject, diffuse the situation by throwing Jesus the football and saying like, hey, do something with this big guy. Isn't it good that we're all going to be in heaven? Now, he was hoping Jesus would sit back and say, you know, you're right. I got a little carried away here. I, I want to apologize. You know, we're all one big happy family, and God loves us all, and God isn't going to send any of us to hell, and we're all going to be there. I apologize. Let's have a good dinner, and remember, we're all going to eat dinner together in the kingdom. But Jesus doesn't take the bait. Listen to what he says. 
beginning in verse 16. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who had been invited, Come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I, on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry. Okay, I'm going to stop there. In this parable, a party has been planned in advance. Guests were invited a long time in advance. When the dinner was ready, they were notified. Today, we would send out emails, Instagrams, text messages, maybe take out a Facebook thing, make some phone calls, send a letter. We'd just, hey, the banquet's ready. Come now. Don't forget the banquet is tonight. Everything is ready. Big spread. Can't wait to see you. And everybody that was invited to that banquet made excuses. I bought a field and haven't seen it yet, so i got to go look at it. That's stupid to buy a field you haven't seen. You know, I bought five yoke of oxen. i got to go try them out. Wait a second. If you bought five yoke of oxen, you're really rich. You have your servants go try them out. Uh, I just got married. Sorry. Well, I can understand that. And um, now, if you treat your Bible like a life book, you ought to circle or underline the word angry. The host was angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor and the crippled, the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. Then the master told the servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. So the host says, I want to invite everybody that can come. Invite those that can't get here themselves that you've got to help get here. I want you to invite the people that are strangers and never expected to be invited. I want my house full. Now let's go back to the dinner that Jesus is at. These dinner guests know exactly who Jesus is talking about. They know he's talking about them. That they had been invited to the big banquet in the kingdom. That their invitation had come from the prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Elisha. That John the baptizer had come on the scene and had told them that the kingdom of God was at hand. And then Jesus had come and said that he is the king of that kingdom and the banquet is ready. Come to my banquet. And they were the ones who were making excuses as to why they didn't want to enter into his banquet. They knew that's what Jesus was saying. So Jesus concludes that parable with this statement. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get the taste of my banquet. So what Jesus says to them is, the banquet and table in heaven is going to be filled, but you're not going to be there. Basically, none of you are going to heaven. You're all going to go to hell. That's what Jesus is saying to those leaders. And by the way, I just want to let you know that this is the last dinner party that any Pharisee ever invited Jesus to. You cannot find one more dinner party that Jesus ever came to. Now, I want you to understand something. Jesus did not get a kick out of upsetting and offending people. But Jesus loves people so much that he refuses not to tell them the truth. Now, there are three things that I believe Jesus wants us to know. So let's take a look at them. Number one is this. 
If you want to be somebody, serve somebody. Listen to what it says in verse 11. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. If you run around making yourself look good, bragging about your successes, if that is what you're all about, I'm going to tell you at some point in time, you will be humbled. I'm sure you've been around people that the only person in the crowd that they're concerned about is themselves. And they want you to know all about their accomplishments. They want you to know about their latest trip. You get their, you get their Christmas letter in the mail, and it's all the great things that they did that year. Uh, you're hanging around them, and it's never about, well, how is your day? How is, how's your life? How are your kids doing? You never, you never hear that. Jesus says, if, that's, if you're into yourself and not into other people, you're going to be humbled. Somewhere along the line, something's going to happen, and you're going to go, ouch. I ran across an illustration, which I thought was very interesting. In, uh, there's, a Be- there's a museum in honor of Beethoven in Bonn. And there was this young uh, student who was fascinated by the piano that Beethoven had composed some of his greatest works. And so she asked the museum guard if she could sit down and play on that piano and then handed him a very generous bribe. And he took the money and said, go ahead. And the girl went to the piano, she sat down, and she played the opening to Moonlight Sonata. And when she was done and she was leaving, she said to the guard, I suppose all the great pianists who come here want to play on that piano. And the guard shook his head and said, Paderewski, the famed Polish pianist, was here a few years ago, and he said he wasn't worthy to touch one key on that piano. Ouch. Hopefully she got the message. You know, if we go around helping people, lifting people up, God says we will be exalted. If we're struggling in our marriages, you feel you don't get respect from your spouse? Give respect to your spouse. You say, I'm not going to give respect to my spouse until they respect me. Well, guess what? You're not going to get any respect. God says if you just humble yourself, you will be exalted. You know, we live in a world where sometimes people think that they've got to be their own PR person. If I'm for me, you'll be for me. I got news for you. If you're for you, you're the only one. Now, listen carefully. There is nothing wrong with power or status or money or fame. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just wrong when you go about it the wrong way. When you go about exalting your power and exalting yourself. God says, be humble. Serve people. And you'll be lifted up. This is a biblical illustration. Matthew chapter 20. 20 to 28. You might want to write that down because I'm sure I didn't give you all the words. Two of the disciples had a great desire to sit with Jesus in the kingdom, and they wanted to sit, one on the right hand and one on the left hand, so they really wanted the place of prominence sitting at the table in the kingdom. Now, this is good. Guess how they asked? They sent their mother to Jesus to ask him, would you let my son sit one on the right and one on the left? That is not a good way to go about it. Well, Jesus couldn't give them those places of honor, but he calls his disciples together because they're really ticked off that the other two had asked for the place of prominence. That's what they wanted, okay? And um, so Jesus says to them, he calls them together and says, in verse 25, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. 
Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus says this, if you want to be great in the kingdom, it only comes through being a servant. It only comes through humbling yourself. Listen to Philippians chapter 2. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. Now, that is humility, isn't it? Okay, now, the needs of others need to be more important to you than your own personal needs. And if you live that way, there will be eternal rewards for you. You say, well, where do you get that from there? Well, let me read for you the rest of the text. I'm sure I didn't print it for you because it was too long. Listen to what it says. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Here's the good point. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. People, if you desire to be somebody, serve somebody. Humble yourself. Number two, you can choose to be rewarded now or later, but you can't have both. Okay? Then Jesus said to the host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or sisters or relatives or rich neighbors. If you do, they will invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor and the crippled, the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So when it comes to our acts of kindness... When it comes to our serving other people, we get to choose when we get our rewards. We can get them now. We can get them later. But you can't get them now and later. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about almsgiving and prayer and fasting. And he says, when you give your alms, you know, don't be like the Pharisees. Now, what the Pharisees used to do when they were about ready to give their alms, which is giving to the poor, they would send some people out in front of them with trumpets. And you'd hear the trumpets, here comes the Pharisee, here comes the Pharisee. And he'd come and he would give his alms. And everybody would go, oh, he gave money to the poor. And Jesus said, well, you just got your rewards. It wasn't wrong to give, but you just got your rewards. There was no sin in what you did, but you just got your rewards. He says to, to the Pharisees, oh, it would be better if you didn't let your right hand know for what your left hand was doing because your father who seeks in secret rewards. Otherwise, do you want the rewards of the people now or do you want the rewards of God later? He says when you pray, Pharisees would go stand in the courtyard and go, I want to thank you, God, that I am not like that pagan over there. And I do this and this and this and this. And everybody in the whole courtyard would go, oh, he does all those things. And so he gets his reward because he gets a pat on the back. And God says, well, you know, if you're going to pray, you ought to go in a closet, close the door. Nobody can see you. You pray. God who sees in secret we will reward you in eternity. If you're going to fast, don't go through public going, oh, 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 I've been fasting for three minutes. I'm starved. I don't know what to do. Face all drawn, sucked in. I can't do that. And uh, he says, people go, oh, he's fasting. Oh, he's such a spiritual person. 
God says, well, you got your reward. You ought to put oil on your face and go around saying, what a great day it is, and nobody should know you're fasting, and then God will reward you because he knows what's really going on. The bottom line is, hey, if you want the rewards now, it's okay. But it's stupid. You say, why is it stupid? What do you want rewards now? Do you want the applause of people, the pat on the back now? Or do you want God to look at you and say, well done? Let me ask you a question. What do you want to hear? Well done? Uh-huh, well done, okay? Third, last. An invite to heaven doesn't come with a rain check. When God says, follow me, and invites you to his banquet, and you know he's tapping on your heart's door and says, let me in, come follow me, I'm inviting you into my family, I want you at my banquet, and you say, not now, maybe later, I'm not interested, the odds are that your seat at the banquet table is going to be filled by somebody else. Now, don't get all theological on me, okay? (laughs) Don't get into the Calvinism and Arminianism and all that other stuff. I'm looking at the big picture, okay? I'm going with the text. If I say to God, no, not now, I want to warn you, tomorrow may never come. We say, wait a minute. There are people out there that have been given 10 chances, numerous second chances, 15 second chances, 25 second chances to trust in Christ. And you are right. And that is only because of the grace and the mercy of the Lord. But you cannot presume upon his grace and his mercy. Why? Because he gets angry when people say, not yet. I got something else to do. Not right now. I'm not interested. But listen to this. Tomorrow may never come. Last week I heard a story. I can't remember who told me the story. So, but here's the story. There were three, there was a person, a lady with a purse, a friend standing next to her, and somebody answered the door. And she had a permit to carry a gun in her purse, a concealed weapon. She lived in Texas. And when she went into her purse to get something out of the purse, she knocked the gun out of the purse. It dropped on the ground. The gun discharged, and the bullet hit her friend in the head and killed him instantly. Nobody at that door expected anybody to die at that moment. Tomorrow never came for that individual. You can't promise that tomorrow is going to come. Second of all, I have talked a lot about the dimmer switch principle, which is this. If God gives me light and I respond positively to the light that I'm receiving, God will turn the dimmer switch up so that I get more light so that ultimately I make the exact response that God wants me to. The more light I respond to, the more light he gives me. But if he gives me the light and he says, I want you to come into my kingdom, I want you to be part of my family, I want you to follow me, and I say to him, not now. Dimmer switch. Okay, well then I'll turn the light down. Let me ask you a question. If you didn't respond properly when the light was up, Do you think you respond properly when you get less light? I don't think so. And the third point is this. In the story, the host of the banquet got really angry. When we reject God's invitation, God gets angry. If there is one person in the world that you don't want to be angry with you, it would be God. He may stop calling, he may stop inviting, he may shut the door on you, and it will be too late. Remember, God is long-suffering, but that doesn't mean he will suffer forever. 
at some point in time, he says, that's it. No more knocking. I'm not interested. Jonathan Edwards preached a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. From what I understand, he preached this over and over and over again. Wherever he went, he preached it. And people were told, we're told that people would hang on to things afraid that they were going to slip into hell. You know, that kind of sermon is, a kind, is kind of taboo in our culture today. But the truth is, God who is holy does get angry when we reject his invitation. So let me ask you a question. If you're here today and you've heard the invitation, you've heard the knocking, what have you done with the invitation? Remember, tomorrow may never come. Remember, the dimmer switch can be turned down. Remember, God does get angry. I'd like us to pray together, and then we're going to stand and sing a couple verses of amazing grace. So let's pray together. Lord, I ask that you would help us to remember. If we want to be somebody, we need to become servants. For if we humble ourselves, we will be exalted. Please help us to seek rewards that will last forever, not just the pat on the back from a friend, but a welcome into your heaven, which says, well done, good and faithful servant. And Lord, if there's someone here today who has been hearing you invite them to your heaven, hearing you say, follow me, may they not make any more excuses. May they turn and say, I accept Jesus as my Savior, and Lord, I'm coming to that banquet. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.